Well, good morning. It is such a pleasure to be here with you once more. And I just love to minister alongside of Pastor Cody and, and Jen. They're dear friends. To me, you've got to understand, a good friend does what Pastor Cody just did. I was nearly up here one musical piece too early. Now, that would have been very, very awkward for me and very, very awkward for you, but he grabbed me and got me back. I mean, I, I would have had to whistle something up here. I don't know. Now, I have, a, I have a good brother that he knows well who would have actually found it great if I had a got up. He would have let me go. So thank you, Pastor Cody. You're a great friend. It's always a pleasure, uh, particularly to do so, opening up one of my favorite books, the book of Ephesians. So I'd ask you to turn there to chapter 1. If you have a copy of the Scriptures, if you don't, there's a pew Bible there that you can use, and you can turn to page 100, 976, 976. And the reason I love the book of Ephesians, and, and again, if you really, really push me, I would say it's my favorite book, but don't push me, that's not nice. It's because in the book of Ephesians, God expands our vision of Him and of His workings in life. His plan for the ages from different angles, from a cosmic angle, where we get to peer into how life here is puppeteered and, and influenced by powerful realms above what we can see with our physical eye. And you can understand some of God's plans for the ages from a church angle, not just a cosmic angle, like who we are as a corporate body and our calling in the world, that we're a new humanity that God has birthed in His Son, Jesus Christ. Then, of course, you'll read about uh, your individual responsibilities and your individual wealth as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, your story toward God, and, and your life and your wealth in Christ, and your walk with Christ from here until you're with Him in person. It's just a wonderful book. It is a favorite of mine. So let me, let me, just before we go there, chapter one, let me tell you about an incident that happened to me this past week. It was my birthday. And so uh, the kids were off school, and they decided to bring dad coffee in bed, which was a lovely gesture, awful coffee. I mean, it's kitty coffee, right? They, they don't really know how to make coffee. But, but it was a lovely gesture. And then they and, and my wife gave me a, a, a present, which was, again, a lovely gesture, but the last thing on the planet that I would ever have wanted or asked for, a bicycle. <laughs> now, that's, no, that's not to discourage any of you from joining the two-week uh, Connect bicycle team, just saying, I'm not going to be leading it. <laughs> and so we, we all got on our bikes, everybody has a bicycle, and we headed down to a local lake for some family time, for, for a picnic, and, and it was wonderful. We got down there, we had some fun. It, it just turned bad when we started heading home. And the reason was that I took the lead at the front of this little Murphy convoy, uh, on my wife's bike because it pulls the carriage that the two-year-old sits on like a prince. <laughs> and so I started pedaling, and within 30 seconds, I was beat. I was just worn out. I mean, this was awful. I was overwhelmed by the heat, confused as to why this is so hard, and discouraged. I mean, the, the road was flat. And, and, and the bike had two wheels, and, and everything seemed like it should be going well. I was pedaling, and, and the pedals were moving really easily, but I wasn't moving forward that fast. In fact, a very slow walker walked past me. <laughs> and he had a, like a cheeky, sneaky little grin on his face as if to say, I'm beating you, I'm winning. And I'm like, I'm going very slow, so you're a very slow walker. You're not really that fast, buddy. And, and it was extremely uncomfortable, and I don't know who had the genius idea of designing bicycle seats as stick-like structures that are shaped like a pointy triangle. I mean, <laughs> what were you thinking? We don't, we don't make any seats that shape for a reason, buddy. <laughs> It was awful uncomfortable, and 
I, I just couldn't handle it. My, I could hear my wife, and I, I can don't totally understand why. She was at the back of the, the convoy, giggling her head off. She couldn't believe. Birthday boy gripping the handles like it was a jackhammer and pedaling as fast, fast as he could and not going anywhere and, and sweating profusely. Uh, and I didn't say this, on her bike, which is pink, bright pink. <laughs> so that was a sight to behold. And so it was fun for them, not so fun for me. So I, confused, discouraged, overwhelmed, quit. I just stopped. And I walked that torture instrument back to the house, to the barks of your royal highness, the prince, who in his language, I think, was saying, you're being decommissioned, get mum back. It was awful. All that was racing through my head was, what's going on here? This, there's a disconnect here. I don't understand why this is so hard. This is a bike ride. I'm healthy. I was confused. And it led to discouragement. And it led to a sense of being overwhelmed. And so I quit. And confusion and discouragement and feeling overwhelmed will do that to you. Will make you quit make you stop. It'll make you give up. And I'm not talking about a bike ride. I'm talking about those same sentiments operating in, in important areas and spheres of life in increasing doses. Life uh, seems to be flowing like just a nice bike ride, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, the unexpected, the uncomfortable happens at work at home. The stresses of finances build and, and the pressures of, of your neighborhood or of your work colleagues or even at home with people who don't believe in Christ mount. You get discouraged and you get confused. What's going on? I mean, I'm in Christ and Christ rules over all but I'm confused as to why life's circumstances aren't being played out the way I think they should be playing out. And I get that I'm adopted and I'm redeemed and I'm destined toward a fantastic destiny with Christ and I'm forgiven and that I'm sealed. Yet sometimes it doesn't feel like life with Christ is, is going that well. It's not a smooth ride. It's like birthday boy Murphy on his bike ride. Now, if you've ever felt that way in, in important issues of life, then you're feeling exactly what our Ephesian brothers and sisters felt in the first century when Paul wrote this letter. They're, they're confused. They're looking out at their world, and it often seems like, like, like Satan has got the upper hand, that Satan's winning, and, and that God is losing. And, and they don't even have to look out. They can look in and they see that, that life's hard as a believer. And it surely shouldn't be this way. There's, there's an assault on, on God's way of life and his views on marriage that we hold dear and his views of sexuality and identity that we hold dear. In, in the Republic of Ireland, I'm from Northern Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, on Friday, they passed a, a, a landslide victory that, that repealed the ban on abortion. Hey, you look at the news and there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people cheering this. What's going on? Well, why, why is there such a disconnect from, from what I believe to be true and real and, and where they're at? It's, it's confusing. It can get discouraging. The Ephesians are discouraged by life in Christ. Where is he? Why is his most important representative in prison. What does that say about the might and the power of God? So they're confused and they're discouraged. And it's the same thought. What is going on? Why does evil seem to have the upper hand? So thankfully, Paul picks up his pen, his plume, whatever he wrote with, and he opens up a new scroll. And he says, let me write into that. Let me encourage discouraged believers about life in Christ who does rule over all. In the little portion of scriptures that we're in uh, this morning, the second half of chapter 1, beginning in verse 15 to 23, what we really see is a prayer. 
And the content of the prayer really answers this, this question or this subject, how to deal well with life when you're confused about what's going on. How do you deal well with life when, when you don't understand, when that lack of understanding and that confusion deflates you and demoralizes you? What's going on, God? So I want to just walk you through these verses and, and hopefully help you catch what God is saying and, and hopefully inspire you to answer Paul's prayer request for yourself, to, to, to make it a reality in your own life. So let's do that. Let's look at the first few verses there from verses 15 to the beginning of chapter 16 where Paul begins with some words of praise, some words of praise, of appreciation of gratitude for the Ephesian believers. Here's what he says, verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you. This is a grateful servant of the Lord for the work that the Lord is doing in the lives of other people around him. Uh, I, I've tried to think of how to say this in as Texan a friendly way as I possibly can. And I've got some special advisors that I've developed over the last few years as it relates to all things Texan, including your linguistic nuances. So this is what I think Paul is saying. I thank God for all y'all's reputation as true believers. I thank God, Paul says, for all yours reputation as true believers. My counselors tell me that it's not enough to say y'all, that that's Southern but not Texan Southern. And that that might be soft Dallas Texan but not Fort Worth Texan. <laughs> it's all y'all. Paul's grateful for the reputation that these believers have. He's heard of it. Now, Paul knew these people personally, but he hasn't been with them for a few years. And so the church has grown, so there's people that he doesn't know there, and so he speaks of their reputation in Jesus Christ, how they have faith in Christ and, and love for all believers. All believers, even the vast number of unlikable believers. They're not the cultural type of Christian they're the real deal. They're committed to Jesus. And because they're committed to Jesus, it's evident on anyone who would peer into their lives. Their, their lives essentially are positioned in the right directions. Faith up, not in. Love out, not in. It's, it's as simple as that. Faith upward, love outward. That's genuine faith. Genuine faith is evident in love. Saving faith is always practical faith. It, it drips, it oozes, it bleeds, it sweats, it smells. Pick your imagery. Love. It's evident to those around you. And it's evident to Paul that, that this fellowship has such a reputation for being true believers that he's grateful to God. I know some people that I've had a part in leading to Christ over the years, and it thrills me no end to know that they love the Lord to the extent that they live outwardly for Him. And the opposite's true also. The discouragement of someone who no longer walks with God. So Paul's unceasingly grateful for this community of believers. Now that established, his thought then shifts quite abruptly into a prayer. A prayer for true believers, and, and, and it really answers that subject question, how to deal well when you're confused about what's going on. This is, this is his prayer, verses 16, uh, the, the latter half, all the way through to 18, Paul's intercession. And remember, Paul has a correct understanding of prayer. Prayer is not wishful thinking, my friend, just crossing your fingers and hoping something happens. Prayer is invoking the power of God into your situation. It's, it's calling heaven down into that situation. So Paul in chapter 6 will talk about the armor of God, standing firm, equipped, but he climaxes it with and pray in the Spirit, always, with all sorts of requests been made unto the Lord. Prayer is, is a weapon to, to live as Christ's followers in this society. So here's what he says, verse 16. 
Remember, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Paul's prayer for believers is a prayer for vision. It's a prayer that they see correctly, that they have better sight that, that they see from the heart, that's inner eyes. Not the eyes in your, on your head, the eyes of your heart, the eyes of faith. That, that see beyond the visible horizons to what's going on in society. There's a lot more than meets the eye, right? That's a saying. There's a lot more than meets the ear. We learned that last week. It, it, someone somewhere is very, very clearly saying, Laurel, and, and, and a lot of confused people are only hearing Yanni, right? So it works with the ear as well. You say something, somebody else hears something else. That, that's what's going on here. You see something, but there's more to see, and you need to see it. But the thing is, you can't see it unless you see through the eyes of faith. And, and so it has to be revealed by the Spirit of God. In chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, you heard last week that the Spirit resides in your life, and He does. But He has multiple ministries. One of them is to reveal Christ to you personally. The reason God has to reveal God is because it's who we're talking about, not a what. God must reveal God. And so Paul's point in this whole section, in this prayer, can be caught in this phrase. I pray that you devote your life to knowing God intimately. I want you to know God intimately. That's my prayer point, is what Paul says. Now, why do you say intimately? Well, because the word there and the phrase, in the knowledge of him, goes towards relational, intimate knowledge of God. This isn't a rational, intellectual, topical understanding of God, like, like God's a subject to be studied just in a book. It, it's firsthand experience and acquaintance and exposure to a relational being that you get to know because you're with that person. Just like you get to know your spouse or your friends or your children, not by reading about them, but by being with them. That's what Paul is praying for here. And that's Paul's motto in life. I mean, I can't think of anybody who knew the oracles of God and, and the mysteries of God's workings in, in life more than the Apostle Paul. And yet, you know, his motto in life, which he expresses in Philippians 3.10, which is written roughly at the same time as Ephesians, is this, that I may know him. Well, Paul, I thought you knew him. Yeah, but he's not talking about just the beginning of the journey toward coming into a relationship with God. He's talking about knowing God personally and intimately as I go through life with him. Jesus in, in John 17 refers to eternal life as being about knowing God. God himself in Jeremiah 9, and that's at the back of your sermon notes for you to study at home, basically says this, don't boast about your wealth, and don't boast about your wisdom, and don't boast about any status or any power you might have in life. Boast about this, God says, that you know me, that you know me. That's worth boasting about. So that's, that's Paul's prayer, but how do you do that? How do you do that? How, how does the Spirit who resides within me reveal to me Himself, the Godhead? How does He open my eyes? Well, this week I, I came across a, a story that I want to share with you that I think captures it well. And it was very personal and meaningful for me for obvious reasons, but I think it would be helpful for you to hear it too. And hopefully you would understand a little bit more to what it takes to, to be in a position of meeting with God for him to open your eyes to understanding him. Here's what it says. It's by a, a chap called Harry Ironside. Harry Ironside was a very well-known preacher in the States in the early 1900s, just, just used by God in a profound way. Here's what he writes. 
I remember years ago while my father, while my dear mother was still living, I went home to visit the family and found there a man of God from the north of Ireland. Oh, you see, I got me. I was a young Christian at the time, engaged in gospel work. He was a much older man, an invalid, who was dying of what we then called quick consumption, which is tuberculosis in the lungs, which is a horrible death. He had come out to Southern California, hoping climactic conditions would be of some help to him, but it was evident that he was too far gone to be recovered to health again. He lived by his own desire in a small tent out under the olive trees, a short distance away from our home. I went out to see him, and I can remember uh, my heart was touched as I looked down on his worn, thin little face, but I could see the peace of heaven upon it. His name was Andrew Fraser. He could barely speak above a whisper, for his lungs were almost gone, but I can recall yet how, after a few words of introduction, he said to me, young man, are you trying to preach Christ to me? I replied, yes, sir, I am. He said, well, sit down a little while here and let us talk together about the Word of God. He opened his well-worn Bible, and until his strength was gone, simply, sweetly, earnestly, he opened up truth after truth after truth after truth as he turned from one page to another in a way that I had never entered into myself. Before I realized it, tears were running down my face. And I asked, where did you get these things? Could you tell me where I could find a book that would open them up to me? Did you learn these things in some seminary or some college? I shall never forget his answer. My dear young man, I learned these things on my knees, on the mud floor of a little sod cottage in the north of Ireland. There with my open Bible before me, I used to kneel for hours at a time and ask the Spirit of God to reveal Christ to my soul and to open up the Word to my heart. And He taught me more on my knees on that little mud floor than I ever could have learned in all the seminaries or colleges in the world. It was not many weeks after this that He was absent from the body and present with the Lord. But the memory of that visit has always remained with me and is a most precious recollection. And Harry Ironside ends with, is it not true that most of us do not stay long enough in the presence of God? Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, Paul's prayer for you, my prayer for you, my prayer for myself, my prayer for my kids is that you would get to know God personally, more intimately, as a believer. He's talking to believers. This is salvific knowledge. This is, this is knowledge of the one you've already believed in, who's available anytime, anywhere. Mud floors, late 1800s of a cold, damp, sod cottage in the north of Ireland, or wooden floors, or marble floors, or tile floors in 21st century air-conditioned Texan homes. God's available. God created you to know him, and he's willing to meet with you and reveal himself to you to to dissipate, to evaporate the fog and the confusion of life that we see around us. Paul unravels a few specific things about that prayer and what's remaining in that section. I've called it a purpose. The purpose behind Paul's inspirational prayer is that you know God intimately. And if I want to push that a little further, Paul says, there's lots of areas in which you can know him more intimately. Here's three. And that's what he does from 18 all the way down to to 23, which ends it out. I want you to know God intimately so you can live well daily. I want to be in your Monday and in your Tuesday and in your Wednesday, in your confusion and help you live well there with me. So look at three what clauses, really, that organize the next seven or eight verses. Paul has three what clauses that that help us follow his, his, his line of thinking. Look at verse 18, that you may know, first what, what is the hope to which he has called you? 
What is the hope to which he has called you? Knowing God intimately helps you live today in light of your hope. You have hope. There is hope. Hope will burst forth, stir up by the Spirit of God when you're with God. It's not a switch that you can flip. It's, 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 it's a mood, really. It's a Christian mood in the present, right? In light of what I know for certain is going to happen in the future because of what God's done in the past. This is the beautiful thing about Christian hope. It, it's, it's timeless. It's transtemporal. Because Jesus, God has acted in Jesus and brought you into a relationship with him, you have a, a destiny. You're adopted. You're redeemed. You have an inheritance that's guaranteed, and that's going to help you live today in the present. It's beautiful. So I want you to know that you have hope. The second what, still in verse 18, is this, that you know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Knowing God intimately helps you live today in light of your worth. Your worth, no, I know you live in Fort Worth. <laughs> and so I would like you to, any time you see Fort Worth on a road sign or on an address label because you live in Fort Worth or around Fort Worth, that you remember that I am worth the world to God. Because what Paul says in verses 13 and 14 is that you have an inheritance. But what Paul says in 18 is that God has an inheritance. And the inheritance that God wants isn't millions of dollars or mineral rights to some land or another planet. It's you. Because he loves you as an individual. Christ died because he loves you. Don't, I don't want to, I, I want to hover over that for a little while. God loves you. I have four kids. I love my kids no end. It would kill me to know that they're going through their little wee days, concerned, anxious, insecure about my love for them because I love them so much that they would be out in their recess or in the cafeteria having their little lunches, not living in their father's love. That's going to put a spring in their step and, and stir up hope. Enjoy. Someone has said that, that God doesn't, wasn't satisfied in possessing sons and stars. He wants sons and daughters. He wants the saints. I think it's beautifully said. You're precious to God, and you spend time with God, and you will understand how loved you are. That's going to help you live in the confusion of the day in which we live. And here's the third what. It really is the rest of the verses there from 19 all the way to 23. Another sermon, really. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach another sermon. I'm, I'm wrapping things up. But there is another sermon there on the, on the power of God. Right, let me read verse 19. And what, third what, is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? Essentially, my words on Paul, knowing God intimately helps you live today in light of his power for us. Paul, and I get it, Paul can get a little bit confusing here because he, he, he's struggling to express the power of God. And so he's piling synonym upon synonym, right? He's exhausting whatever thesaurus dictionary is available to him to try and get you to understand the power of God. And so I tried to do that to figure out how I could help you get it, and I failed miserably. I went up into the universe, and I started to read about how the sun is a mid-sized uh, star, and it's one of 400 billion in our galaxy. 400 billion. But here's the thing. Our galaxy is one of 170 billion galaxies. So I can't go up there and try and grasp uh, uh, the power of a God who just spoke that into existence effortless. And so I, I came back down the earth, and I, I tried to explore the planet. And I mean, there's a beautiful big oak tree in our house, and I, outside our house, and I go, well, that's huge. It's beautiful. Who designed that to emerge from something this small? Or who designed the human eye and populated this earth with eight million different types of living creatures? 
I, I, I couldn't grasp it. So I went in, I, I, I read about the eye, I read about the brain, which apparently is the most complex object that man has ever studied. And I read about how every one of you, if we were to stretch out your DNA, which is unique to you, it would go out 34 billion miles. <laughs> That's the Pluto and back six times. You can be really tall if you're stretched just in the right way. It's, it's, it's incomprehensible. And so I ended back where Paul ends. How do I help my Ephesian believers understand the power of God in their day-to-day -day life? And so look at what he does. Three examples. Verse 20. Power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Every day you fear death. If it's not for you, it's for your loved ones. That they would be gone. God has power over death. God used that power righteously in raising up Christ from the grave. That's, that's power. Man can't solve death. Man can't eradicate death. Man can't ban death. God can. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is an invitation for those of you who aren't, to spend some time today thinking about where you're at with God. Because this could be resurrection power for your life. Look at the second example in verse 20 and on into 21. And he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. He put all things under his feet. The language there really is, is speaking of primarily all the conceivable demonic powers that you could ever creatively conjure up. Christ is over that. And, and just to stress the point, he says it again, all of it's under his feet. It's vast. It's, it's, it's matchless. It's incomprehensible. It's universal. It's forever. And then beautifully in his third example, at end of verse 22 and into verse 23, and he gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. Lots there. Bottom line is this. He's ours. He's yours. You're well connected. I mean, you're really, really well connected. It's, it's beautiful. That will be evoked in your life and put a spring in your step despite your circumstances if you spend time with him. So I finally made it home on that torture chamber carriage. And I dumped it there on the drive and I went in and I cooled down and I at some point later on came back out and I stared at the thing. And it's amazing what the bike will reveal to you about the bike, how it will open up your eyes when you spend some time with the bike. This thing had gears. <laughs> oh yeah. And I was on the worst gear that you could be on for that surface. That's why I was pedaling like crazy and the thing was moving, but the bike wasn't moving forward. And it gets worse. This thing had two wheels, both flat. <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, yes, I'm, I'm not a biker. I told you I'm not a biker. Not seeing the ride or the bike properly is going to affect the ride. Not, not seeing life in the company of God is going to be a rough journey. And so how do you deal well with life when you don't understand what's going on, when you're confused about what's going on? You don't keel over, you lean in, you hug tighter, you get up earlier to meet with your God. He's willing to meet Andrew Fraser, who I can't wait to meet also, on the mud floor of a damp, cold cottage in the north of Ireland in the 1800s. He's willing to meet with you. He's available. You're the one who has to check your calendar and make sure you prioritize. And when you do, you will really begin to see with the eyes of faith that Christ is over all. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. You, you, your spirit reveals yourself to us as we meet with you in prayer around your word, with you, like Andrew did, 
having you instruct us in, in your plans for the ages and, and your love for us. Lord, we're grateful to you for Christ. And, and I pray that you would help us live this week in light of our desire to grow in you and, and all that could be if we just walk a little bit more closely with your son. For we ask it in his name. Amen.